Hello, my friends. This is Linda Lippin, and welcome to the Pilates Goddess Podcast. Welcome back, my friends. It's Linda here. And today on the Pilates Goddess Podcast, we are discussing cues that Pilates teachers shouldn't use. I think you might find this one interesting. This is something I've spoken about and written about before, but I have some very distinct opinions, as you can imagine, (laughs) about cueing and Pilates. And some of it, you know, comes from my own experiences of having cues work or not work. But really, some of it comes from experiencing the long-term effects of those cues in my own body and feeling how crappy it felt. (laughs) So that's what we're going to talk about today. You may wonder too where I get some of these ideas from for episodes, and I'm letting you know that I get some from my actual colleagues who are Pilates teachers. I see the questions that they post um, in different uh, Pilates teacher Facebook groups and other places online, and I kind of work from those. And lately, I've been seeing a lot of questions about cueing where the, say, a younger teacher will say, I can't use this cue anymore. None of my clients understand it. So what could I use that's better? And a lot of times there actually isn't another cue you can use that's better because sometimes what you're cueing for is inappropriate. So that's really what I want to talk to you about today are those cues that you shouldn't use as a teacher, that you shouldn't listen to as a client because they not only don't work, but over the course of time, they can cause physical problems and pain within the body. And for each example that I give you of a cue that Pilates teachers shouldn't use, I am also going to give you a little true story to go along with it so that you understand why. And then for some of them, I'll give you a few things that you can try on your own body and see how they feel for you. Okay. So one of the biggest issues that we see in the Pilates studio is lower back pain. We see a lot of lower back pain and we see a lot of neck and shoulder pain. The majority of the time we're not dealing with huge pathologies. We're just dealing with people who have muscular imbalances, who sit at desks and then go play golf or, you know, to do, do, do different things like that. Um, And they come to us again, because they've, you know, been told that Pilates can really help stabilize their, their backs. Now, one of the biggest cues that I hear used for the lower back is neutral spine. In fact, I did a whole episode on the myth of neutral spine. So you should go back and take a listen to that one. But... (laughs) Neutral spine as a cue is really the worst. And I'm going to tell you why. Number one, no one really has any clue as to what neutral spine is. Okay. No, I'm saying it again. None of us really have any idea what neutral spine is because neutral spine looks different on everybody. It depends on your body shape. It depends on your body size. There are some folks who have a gorgeous quote unquote neutral spine and a great lift, but there are some folks who have, you know, scoliosis and other issues and their neutral spine looks like nothing you would ever really want in your body. And once you start imposing a vision of what a neutral spine should look like, that's really when clients get into trouble. So an example story for this is that I have a friend, Danielle, and she's actually written me a a five-star review. And Danielle was going to a chain 
a Pilates studio in her neighborhood, which she actually loves to go to. And, you know, this is part of the, the social aspect of, of Pilates, right? She doesn't necessarily love all the teachers, but she loves the owner of the studio. She loves the other women who she goes to Pilates with, who are in class with her. Her favorite coffee shop is right there. You know, it, it kind of all works as a way to get her out of the house, to get her socializing and to get her some good exercise. But she scheduled an online consultation with me because she was having really bad tailbone pain that was reminiscent of the tailbone pain that she had had when she injured her tailbone while pregnant and then giving birth to her daughter like many, many years ago. And I said, so tell me, Danielle, are they telling you to be in neutral spine? And she said, yes. And I said, okay, fine. What are they telling you neutral spine is? And she basically said to me that whenever she was on her back on the reformer doing footwork or doing um, any work with her feet in the straps, you know, frogs, leg circles, things like that that her teacher told her that she needed to have her lower back lifted up between one and two inches from the mat. Now, my back doesn't do that. If I lift my lower back up an inch or two off the ground, I have to push my hips forward into an anterior pelvic tilt and actually drop my weight right onto my tailbone. So I what I basically said to her was ignore that. Just don't listen to that at all. Get very heavy in your sacrum in that triangular shaped bone right at the bottom of your pelvis, just above your coccyx or your tailbone. I said, just get heavy there, get wide in your pelvis, pull your abdominals in, open up your collarbones and just try to keep your spine long so you can breathe. But stop trying to lift your lower back up an inch or two off the mat because that's clearly not helping, nor is it necessarily your neutral. Also remember, my friends, that neutral spine is going to feel and look different whether you're standing up on your back or on your stomach, right, (laughs) or on your side. So asking somebody who, you know, might have their lower back go forward an inch when they're standing to recreate that lying down is a very different experience and is not necessarily the neutral that they need when lying down. And this is what I mean by even saying it. It's like our spines move all the time. Our ribs move when we breathe. Our spines move when we breathe. It's, it's you know, anytime you move your head around, you move your body around, like your spine's moving. So really neutral spine, not so much. So I encouraged her to find basically neutral pelvis, right, which is definable when the hips and the pubic bones are in the same horizontal plane. Or as I'll just say to my clients, don't really tuck your tail under or stick it out, but just get very heavy and wide in your sacrum and your pelvis. And that really does it for most of them. And then they just pull the abdominals up and in. I also have had several clients um, who I worked with when I was teaching at Parrot Key, right at the private island in Turks and Caicos, who were trying to do things like the 100 and the ab series still in neutral spine. So in other words, they were still trying to keep their lumbar spines slightly lifted up off the mat while they were going into spine flexion. And that was hurting them. And that wasn't really helping them at all. So once again, You know, remember that people are going to hold on to these phrases when they leave the studio if you're not really sure if they're working. And you know how you can be sure that your cue isn't working, that your client isn't feeling any better. So if that same woman is coming back to your class like three times in a row with the same tailbone pain that's just getting worse, then obviously the way you're cueing the spine is not helping the client right? So you might want to look at doing something else. I don't know how else to say that, right? And there's no nice way of saying that. 
basically, if your client keeps coming back with the same pain and the same discomfort and you keep giving them the same cues and they're not getting any better, then you need to look at at what you're doing. Just saying. So let's kind of move up the chain a little bit. And the next cue that I hear a lot that I find very difficult for most bodies to deal with is connect ribs to hips. Keep the ribs and the hips connected. Drop your rib cage. Don't let your rib cage flare, whatever that looks like. Now, why don't I like that cue or any of those cues? Because number one, our lungs are in our rib cage. So your rib cage does have to move when you breathe. It's just a fact. And as your lungs expand within the rib cage, your diaphragm moves, right? Your diaphragm drops down and makes the ribs expand. So for a lot of your clients, if they're really holding their abdominals in and they're breathing at the same time and they're not allowing that breath to get into their belly at all, I don't know where you expect them to breathe if they're not flaring their ribs. Secondly, a lot of folks are just tight. They're tight in the back. We know that, right? That they come in, their backs are super tight, their abdominals are often weak, their hip flexors are often really tight. And that kind of leads them into naturally a little more of an anterior pelvic tilt. So a lot of times the way those clients are going to work on closing their rib cage is they are literally going to shove their ribs down, like just down towards their spine and toward their back and possibly tuck their pelvis under a little bit in order to get that connection of ribs to hips that we're talking to them about. Okay. Again, that's not going to be helpful. When they're in that position, they can't breathe. Okay. They can't move their rib cage. And then any movement that you give them of their spine, whether it's flexion or hyperextension or anything, is going to feel crappy and not be really great because they're kind of locking down their midsection, which, you know, is appropriate in some instances, but not for most of what we're doing in a Pilates session. So my friend, Leslie Powell, who's a fabulous teacher, said to me once in a, in a training that when we talk to our clients about dropping their ribs and doing that rib to hip connection, that it makes them feel like an old person who has accidentally buttoned their vest or sweater to their pants so that they can't quite stand up and everything's really tight around them. It starts to make them feel constricted. And that's really not what we want. So what do I encourage you to do instead? I encourage you to allow your clients to breathe and be wherever it is they are now. And trust that as they do the work and as they work their spine through a little flexion and a little extension or hyperextension, a little rotation, and as they're really working on the lift of their spines and their torsos and standing and in strengthening all of those muscles that help assist that, and you're making sure that they're breathing the whole time. I don't care how they're breathing. I don't care if it's in through the nose, out through the nose, in through the nose, out through the mouth, in and out through the mouth because their nose is blocked, whatever. As long as your clients are breathing and they're moving and they're moving relatively well and they're not in pain over the course of time, I promise you over the course of time, you're going to see that rib flare shift a little bit. But again, 
when you're looking at people in static positions, you know, don't worry about their rib flare. They need to get air in right now. They need to get air in and out as best they can. And if their backs are tight and their diaphragms are tight and they're not properly working uh, their powerhouse and maybe haven't been for many, many years, you're not going to get them to do the right thing or be in the right place by simply telling them to connect their ribs to their hips. I mean, think about that. And, and while we're talking about that, I would like you to do that. So in the same vein as the cue we were just talking about in terms of neutral spine, like lie on your back for a second and, and lift your lower back up an inch or two off the mat and tell me if that feels neutral to you, because I doubt it does. Now, do the, you know, get into whatever position it is. It could be standing, it could be sitting, could be whatever. And really drop your ribs down, like really drop your ribs in and connect your ribs to your hips and then try to breathe without letting your ribs flare at all. And you're going to find that that doesn't really work so well. Now, for some of us, it may work fine because we're used to doing posterior lateral rib cage breathing because we have the space and flexibility there, and we've been doing it for a long time. But for most of our clients, they're not going to find that. And the biggest fucking frustration you can have as a client is being consistently told by a teacher that you need to get your body to look a certain way or be in a certain position when you are finding that to be impossible. So instead of thinking, I don't want the ribs flared when the client is kind of in these neutral or non-moving positions, what I would be looking at is, let's take this client through a workout, (laughs) an exercise, and cue them appropriately and see if we can get their back and their body to move in different directions. And maybe we don't do huge ranges of motion at the beginning. Maybe we kind of stay mostly kind of straight or mostly flat. And then we move from there. And slowly over the course of time, as the clients get stronger, you know, you need strong abdominals in order to be able to let that back loosen up a little bit, right? You need strong abdominals in order to be able to allow that diaphragm to move a little bit more. You know, there's a whole lot that that's going on here. And knitting the ribs or holding the hips and the ribs together all the time is not going to be great. Now, is it a cue I never use? I have a few clients who every once in a while, because I know them well, I'll say to them, hey, I know that you can be on your back in this position and connect your ribs and and hips in front a tiny bit more, just a tiny bit. So you can still breathe. You can still let your ribs move. But in general, unless I know somebody really well and I know that's going to work for them, that's not a cue I go near. Third cue that we should never use ever, ever, ever is shoulders down the back, shoulders out of the ears. And I'm going to tell you why, because yes, we have tons of clients in neck pain and yes, lots of clients who feel a lot of shoulder tension in their upper shoulders. And some of that is due to weakness in the back muscles, right? And in the lower shoulder muscles. But what happens is when we start to push our shoulders down onto our rib cage is that we start to compress the ribs. And since the ribs are attached to your spine, when you push your shoulders way, way down and you feel your ribs kind of getting pushed down with them, it actually starts to overstretch the muscles that hold your neck together. (laughs) And so what you can start to have happen is an actual destabilization of the neck and extra tightening of the rib cage, especially the upper rib cage, and then actually more pain and more stiffness. 
I learned a lot about this over the past year because it turns out that what I thought was an old right shoulder injury is actually coming from my neck and it's coming from a pretty severe arthritic deterioration um, in my neck. And when I was in my neurologist's office and she was showing me the MRI and we were kind of going through this, I said, oh, that's why I hate pushing my shoulders down onto my rib cage. And I really love lifting my arms up overhead and opening my armpits, and opening my collarbones and getting as much lift and extension up through my spine and my arms and my shoulders as I can. And she was like, yeah, that is why. And those are the things that you need to be doing because the more you push down and squeeze down and back, the more harm you're actually doing. You're putting way too much compression down into the upper ribs and you're destabilizing your neck in a very real way. And I was like, well, there we are. Have you ever noticed that? There's a moment in all Pilates teacher training where you really start to work on upper body stuff, like in the, you know, high intermediate to advanced level stuff. And almost everybody's neck freaks out at that moment. And it's partly because we're consistently, as new teachers, trying to teach shoulders down the back, ribs and hips together. (laughs) right? And all of these things kind of compress us in the midsection. We don't want to be compressed in the midsection, my friends. We want to be pulled in and up and lifted and extended and a little more free through the spine and and through the midsection. Yes, during exercises, there's times when we want to be nice and tight and compressed because that is what we need to do for that exercise. That does not mean that we need to live in those positions. So I have many examples of this one, uh, many from clients, many from apprentices who I've worked with in varying teacher trainings. Um, But also from my own body, when I was a much younger Pilates teacher, I had a lot of problems with my neck, um, a lot of neck stiffness and a lot of neck pain. And I just kept pushing my shoulders down and pushing my shoulders down and pushing my shoulders back. And that pain got worse and worse and my ribs got worse and worse. And then my lower back got worse. And then ultimately I stopped doing that. Right. And as soon as I stopped doing that and started just letting my shoulders go and letting things open up a little more and focusing much more on the extension and lift of my spine, things got better. So now I just talk to my clients. And if you want to know the basic cues that I use with my clients, it's, If they're standing up, I ask them to just have the weight really even on their feet, really pull up through their thighs and their legs, have their sacrum slightly heavy behind them, have their chest lifted and their head up and just breathe. Okay. If they're on their backs, I ask them to have a relatively heavy sacrum with the hip bones feeling nice and wide and heavy. I ask them to not force their lower back up, down, or anywhere. I ask them to breathe, and I ask them to try to think about lengthening up through their spines and through their heads away from their pelvises and open up their collarbones a little bit, just thinking about a little maybe squeeze back at the armpit, just to give a little bit of back support for the shoulder girdle and... I have them breathe there, okay? You don't want clients in a position where they're compressing their spines all the time or they're compressing their spines just to lie down. I see tons of clients who have been instructed when they get on their stomachs to actually pull their abdominals into their spine so much that they're almost flattening out their lumbar spine before they go into a hyperextension. And why would you actually want do that. Allow that lower back to move a little bit forward and up to assist the hyperextension of the spine that you're bringing your client into, right? I mean, that makes more sense to me. Um, 
avoid any position where it feels like your client's bearing down instead of lifting up, basically, is what it comes down to. So again, my three cues, I got three of them for you this time that Pilates teachers should never use are one, neutral spine, two, drop your rib cage and keep the ribs and hips connected, and three, shoulders down the back. So I hope you found this informative. I hope you found this interesting. I'm interested in whether you agree with me or not. If you have other experiences with these cues, I would love to hear about them. And you can, you know, you can email me, Linda at lindalippin.com. You can go on to any of my social media pages um, and leave comments. But I would really love to know, do you use these cues? Do you find them useful? And if not, why do you still use them? (laughs) So be well, my friends. Thanks again, as always, for listening. And I will talk to you next time. Thank you so much for listening to the Pilates Goddess podcast. Music brought to you by Nerd Salad. Please leave a review on Apple Podcasts, especially if you liked it. And please like, share, and subscribe wherever you listen to your podcasts. Thanks.